Shall we pray? There we go. <laughs> Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Holy Spirit, be in my lips and in the ears and hearts of everyone present that we may all hear a good word from you. Amen. So there's this, this cute young couple, and they go out on their first date. And they have dinner, and they have conversation, and maybe it was him, maybe it was her, maybe it was both of them, but by the end of the day, they both know where they stand. Now, you know the story can finish in two different ways, right? The first is, they knew that there was going to be no second date. <laughs> Something went wrong. No second date it just wasn't clicking. There wasn't that chemistry or whatever it was supposed to make that work. And the other one is, by the end of the date, they knew that this was the beginning of a lifelong romance. Now, we like that, that ending to the story, Right? They knew that, that something was right. There was good communication there. They were in right relationship with one another, and it was good. But how do you make that happen? It's a big question, right? Words are powerful. And sometimes saying the right thing is powerful. Sometimes saying the wrong thing is powerful. Words can make alive. They can also cut down. When you get into a, an altercation with someone, words are exchanged, and they aren't, aren't always good. In the same way that some words can break a relationship down, other words can restore them. And be, whether it's between God and us or people, words are powerful. This idea of salty words, you ever heard that phrase before? Oh, those are salty words. <laughs> what, what kind of image comes to mind when you hear someone say, oh, those are salty words? Well, maybe it's they're sassy, right? Oh, there's a sassy teenager. That person got all salty with me all of a sudden. Not just teenagers, adults can do it too. Or maybe it's, oh, those are some salty words, like profanity, four-letter words, whatever you want to call it. Eh, we, we don't, do we talk about like that around here? Salty language. But the kind of language I'm trying to talk about here about salty words is savory language. Language that we use within the church, which are good words, biblical words, that have a lot to say to us and for us, but outside of these doors, they don't necessarily resonate in the same way because uh, people don't use them as much. And so as I started thinking about what kind of words are, are powerful, the couple that came to, or the first one that came to mind that we use here a lot that's powerful, not quite used so much outside, are these two words that mean the same thing. The first is Zedekah, and the second one is dikaiosine. And if you've studied the biblical languages, more power to you. But let me translate to those for those of you who haven't. Both the same word in Hebrew and Greek for righteousness. Righteousness is zedekos, dikaiosine, righteousness. Now, the big word. What does it mean? I've looked for some, some healthy and helpful working uh, definitions of these the, these two words and how they're related in the biblical text. There are a couple that have been helpful for me. So here, here's the first one. Righteousness is right relationship. And this has to do with how, how we talk to one another, how we relate to one another. When you're, you're right with other people, you're on even footing. Things are working well. There's no tension. There's no conflict. You live in right relationship. Same thing with God as with people. You know when you're on the wrong foot with somebody, and you know when there needs to be reconciliation. Now, likewise, we can take this a step further and say that, that righteousness is reality. And let me explain that for a second. It's not the reality that we create. It's the reality that God creates. When God says how things go, goes in this world, then there is that right reality. And when we accept that and live by it, we are right with God. We're right with other people. Now, I don't have to tell you that there are plenty of people in this world that try to create their own realities that are contrary to God's reality. And this is truly the, 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 the crux of what sin is. It's living outside of the reality of God or in a distorted reality. And our enemy knows how to distort things so that they look tantalized and they look good, but they just don't have that savor of God's reality. It comes in many different ways, shapes, and forms. But at the heart of all of this, there's a big question. What makes you acceptable to those around you? What makes you acceptable to God? What makes you acceptable to other people? That's righteousness, right? Relationship, right? What makes you acceptable? 
Now, when Jesus encountered some people who had a distorted view of reality that weren't living in right relationship with God, even though they thought they were, he could see that there were a couple things that would trip them up, ways that they thought that they were righteous in a way different than what his reality was for them. We, we usually think of them as the Pharisees, but there was a few other groups that kind of um, gathered around the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the uh, leaders of God's people at that time. And so for a lot of them, it was about pedigree. Where do you come from? What's your background? Um, immutable characteristics is kind of how we talk about it today. And the Pharisees said, well, if you have good Jewish blood, then you're right with God. No questions asked. That was one way. Another way was, well, if you know the right stuff, if you know the right stuff about God, if you know the Torah really well, and you know the, the rules surrounding it, then you're right with God. Or even a step further, not just knowing God, but knowing what he says to do and then doing it. If you do that all perfectly, you are right with God. You're living in right relationship with God and people, and you're living in God's reality. Jesus took issue with it. He said, you know, if you want sons of Abraham, I can make them out of these stones, right? That's, it's not about pedigree. It's not about immutable characteristics. There's some things you can't change. It's not about that that makes you right with God, that creates that righteousness. It's not about how much you know, because that word enough is a really dangerous one. Have you noticed that? How much is enough? Do I know enough? Do I know enough? Same thing with doing, right? Have I done enough? Have I done enough to make God happy with me? Have I done enough to make those around me like me or accept me? And it's a dangerous road and a slippery slope because there's never enough. So all of this kind of leaves us in a spot where our right relationship can't be about something that we do. And my friends, that's exactly where Jesus finds us because we can't do it on our own. And Paul had a really beautiful way of talking about this in Romans 3. And that's where I, I kind of want to land us in Scripture this evening. Because whenever you hear that word righteousness, I think that comes up a lot in, in Scripture. And if you don't kind of have that idea of right relationship or God's reality, it can be a little confusing. So Paul's been talking about how people try to grasp after right relationship with God by the things that they do, the things they know, by their, their heritage and all of that. And he says there's a different way. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God, the right relationship with God, has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, to all who trust Jesus, since there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's Paul's way of saying everybody has messed up, has made a mess of the relationships that God has placed in their lives and are on uneven footing with God and other people. We've all done it. We've all made a mess. But God doesn't leave us there. They are justified. Freely. There's another big churchy word. We could talk about that one. They are justified, made right with God freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's not on you to create that right relationship. God does it for you. Jesus goes to the cross for you to create that right relationship, to mend what is broken. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his right relationship. You see what he does there? He demonstrates what right relationship looks like when we don't know what it looks like. Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. How do human beings relate? You do something bad to me, I do something bad back. And we can say that kids do that. It's very easy to see, but oh, adults, we hide it, but we do it, right? I'll find a way to pay you out. I'll, I'll find a way to do it. Or if not, actively, maybe I'll harbor that in my heart against you, and I just will avoid you. God doesn't do that. He sweeps that sin away and makes way for right relationship. God presented Jesus to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. God demonstrates right relationship when we don't know what it's supposed to look like. And it looks like him loving us before we did anything to merit anything. That's how it works. So my question as we think about this word of righteousness and right relationship is, can you make that happen? Can you make a right relationship happen? 
Can you? Think about that couple who went on the date and realized at the end what was happening, right? Did either of them make that right relationship happen? Well, I guess we could say that they probably didn't do things to get in the way of it if it turned out okay, but if they did say some things that didn't sit well, then that they landed on the, well, I guess we're not going on a second date. It, it, we can find a hundred different ways to mess relationships up, true? We can do it really, really easily. But to make a re relationship work right, it's kind of a miracle. And that's what we needed. That's what God gave us. So that when Jesus says from the cross, it is finished, he is making right relationship with you and me. He's making that happen. We are helpless. And so God makes of us what it needs to be. So what is God trying to, to tell us about this word of, of righteousness? There's a couple things that I, I've noticed that I think would be helpful. If you try to create righteousness based on the immutable characteristics that you have, and we all have them, or the things you've done or the things you know, it's futile. If it's you're trying to do it, that kind of righteousness doesn't work because eventually you're going to mess it up. God knows this, and that's why he sent Jesus. So true righteousness only comes by trusting God to do what only God can do and not trying to do it ourselves and trusting in the grace and the goodness that God has said that he has for you. When someone says, I love you, you want to trust that, that what they're saying is true, right? I really do know that you love me. I trust that. I see the evidence of it, or maybe I don't, and it's harder for me to trust that. And God says to us over and over again, amplified throughout all creation, I love you. I'm going to take care of you. Not just now, but always. So think back to this young couple, right? So let's say that the, the, the story ended with, they knew by the end of the night that this was the beginning of a beautiful lifelong romance. That's not the total end of the story, right? We could like to say, and they lived happily ever after, but you know that isn't reality. That isn't real reality. In truth, there were many times where they said things and even did things that made things not in right relationship. So what did they do? Ta, we're just done. No, they reconnected. They said those words that are so hard to say sometimes but are so life-giving. I'm sorry, and I forgive you. I'm sorry, and I forgive you. So what does it look like to be righteous? In right relationship with God and people, little to be living in God's reality? It sounds like Jesus to me. Don't you think? Shall we pray? Father God, we thank and praise you for giving us your righteousness, your right relationship, because the truth of the matter is we often don't know what that looks like. And we will concoct all sorts of realities for ourselves to try to make that happen. And it all doesn't mean a thing. And yet you show us a new way forward. You love us, even though we are unlovable. You forgive us, even though we don't deserve it. And you create right relationship with us because of what Jesus did on the cross. We thank you for that. Pray that we will live in right relationship with you and others, and that that would be a witness to a world that needs to see what those things look like. Right relationship and love and devotion and forgiveness. Grant those things to us by your Holy Spirit and make us righteous. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes far beyond what our heads can understand, keep your hearts and your minds always in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who makes you righteous. Amen.